preview. Ow. Oh. And we're live! Dang it. <laughs> so if you came here early and you were in the chat, um, apparently... We fixed it. I, I, I didn't set it up completely for my wife, and so yeah. she hit the button See? that should have started it, but it didn't start it. I hit the right button. So just, there was another well, Welcome back set. to the shop. We're going to have a fun time tonight. Um, this is going to be a live Q&A, and if you are live, go ahead and put your questions down in the chat, and we'll try and get to as many of them Give as we them can. To me. I can't guarantee we'll get to them all, but we'll try. Um, if you are watching this and not live, then go ahead and look in the description below, and I'll have a list of all the questions with a timestamp beside them, so you can jump to that question or close to that question, and uh, you can look through it and see what questions you want to hear answered. So this should be kind of fun. Um, also in the description, I have a link to Teespring. It is a new, uh, well, it's not a new site, but it's a new thing I'm playing with, and I want to try and create some specialty shirts uh, like, uh, uh, you know, Happy Little Wood Curls or one for my wife that's Saw. Oh, yeah. um, now that we're live, you'll add that in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if you have any ideas for some swag or a specialty shirt, something I might run for a little while, uh, let me know. Uh, we might uh, we might play with that and have a little bit of fun. Um, oh, we're also going to Maker Central in May over in UK, and I'm going to be soon giving away two free tickets to Maker Central. I haven't figured out how, what I want to do to do that. Um, so if you guys have some idea for a fun giveaway, let me know. We'll probably do that on a live sometime around Christmas. I think we should get a certain amount of subscribers. <laughs> yes. I hit 100,000 and I'll give away two tickets. Hey. Hey. Come on now. <laughs> we'll see. Why um, not? Yeah. Oh, oh, let me show you the, the fun thing, though. Um, and if you haven't seen it recently, if you haven't seen it, I just, I just posted it on Instagram. Uh, you go to my Instagram page and today... I flipped over the table because ye yesterday, the day before, I finished the underside of the table. So all of the base is finished, all the underside is finished, now I can flip the table over and finish everything on top of it. And I'm really getting excited about this because it's almost done and it'll probably be done in another two days or so. Um, but the problem is I had to flip the table over and it's sitting on my bench and I can't just flip it. Number one, it's 400 pounds. How do I pick this thing up and flip it? And so I put out a call, you know, is anyone free to come give me a hand? And no one was free and no one was able to come give me a hand. didn't trust these guns. I don't know why. <laughs> yes. The table weighs more than, what, three of you? <laughs> Four of you? <laughs> um, so I ended up uh, I ended up rigging up a hoist system to jack it up in the room and rotate it over and put it back down. It was kind of fun. But I put a video of that on Instagram if you want to see how I did that. Uh, but here, let me show you the, the table and uh, show you what we've got going on here. Now that we're on this camera, and this is the table. Uh, I have a, uh, I was filling all the, the bug holes and things, and so there's a coat of wispy epoxy on here. I'm gonna be um, planing and smoothing all that down, but I thought I'd show you some of this. Let's see how close I can move the camera. Oop, don't step on the cord. I was gonna say, in the rest of your shop. Yes, I zoom in here. Focus, there we go. And so I'm loving how this is coming out. Once I smooth that all down, this will be a lot of fun. So it gives you a, a, a close preview. It's not going to be this glossy. It's going to be more of a matte finish, um, except for on the epoxy holes. And you actually see down into the epoxy down below and see the blue coming out. Just a, uh, a quick run through. <laughs> Just to a taste of what will come. So Saturday's video will be all about finishing... Um, <laughs> Move back. Saturday's video will be all about finishing the base. All about uh, the other. base. <laughs> you started it, not me. <laughs> uh, we'll be finishing the base and finishing the underside. And then next week's video will be the final video in the series. And then probably a week after that, I'm going to do a compilation video where I'm going to put the entire process into one quick video. Um, I don't know. How and us may be enjoying it. Yeah, yeah, a picture of us around the table. Well, I don't know about that, because we have really junky chairs. Um, yeah, well, there's always going to so, be hey, another project. So, hey, that may be coming soon. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if I want to get into chair making, but we'll see. Because I, I don't want, you know, like uh, Windsor chairs, which would be easy with hand tools, easier with hand tools, um, because the, the wispy Windsor chair would look out of place in front of this table. So, um. Let's see. Uh, someone put a uh, Carbonite Gamorian put a, uh, a question in earlier, and he was asking. Uh, he doesn't. At least I think it was Carbonite Gamorian. 
pretty sure it was. Um, he was asking, he, he, he's having a hard time. He sent time. you an email, yeah. Yeah, he sent me an email. He was having a hard time um, planing surfaces and, and truing up sides. Um, you know, you get to a certain point in your life and you, you, you can't do that anymore. Um, and so he was asking, you know, do you have ways of doing it with a router? And I have to say, well, I'm kind of the bad one to ask for that. But most of the time, yes, you can do most anything with a router. If you look at the, the table flattening I did, um, you can do the same thing with a router and set up a jig that will run a router back and forth across. And if the jig is nice and tight and true, um, then you can flatten out a surface anywhere in that. Um, and then if you want to make a tenon, it's just a matter of lowering it down inside of that. Or the same thing with a, uh, uh, with a mortise as you're plunging down into the hole. So yes, you can do all that work with a router, um, but uh, it's a lot of work. Because <laughs> you basically end up making a jig for everything you want to make. But yeah. Um, but let's get into the live questions. All right. So Devinder has the first one. It said, did the table feel like timber framing? Um, no, uh, it, it's all, um, half lap, um, or, um, uh, what's what I'm looking for, bridle joinery. So it's not quite, that's not a very common joinery method for timber framing. Um, and the, the, though the beams look very big and beefy in the video, once they go underneath the table, they don't look so big and beefy anymore. Um, the, the tabletop is, is large enough that everything looks a lot smaller. So, uh, no, it doesn't quite feel like timber framing. But I do want to get to that soon because I have several timbers that I just picked up. And I actually want to do a, uh, a mailbox post, a massive mailbox post. Um, so that might be coming up soon. We'll see, though. All right, let's see. Russ Staples asks, are you going to use um, sandpaper at all? I'm assuming on the table. Um, little bits. Um, I have my high grit sandpaper here um, that I use for the epoxy. Um, with the epoxy, I want to get... I want to get a glass smooth surface so you can see down through the clear epoxy. Um, and it's not something you can get with a plane or a card scraper. It's always going to leave lines or tracks in the, in the epoxy work. Um, so I'm going to be using, uh, I'll be starting at like 400 grit sandpaper and going up from there into micro mesh, which is like 30,000 grit is the top. Um, so I can actually buff out and shine the epoxy. So I'll be using sandpaper for that. Um, other than that, uh, I mean, there's going to be a few spots where I'm going to be where I'm going to be touching with it, but most of it's just the the scraping, um, especially with epoxy. A card scraper or a cabinet scraper is a fantastic tool for smoothing it out. Um, if you use sandpaper on epoxy, it just gums up and it fills the the, the sandpaper too quickly. Um, so for the epoxy work, a uh, card scraper is a fantastic tool for that. What else we got? All right. So Samuel Wise um, said, if you had to use a hoist to flip it, how are you going to get it upstairs? Uh, four guys in about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the problem is the, the video makes it look like it's extremely heavy. And it is fairly heavy. It's 400 pounds. Um, but two decent guys can pick up a 400-pound table and rotate it around. Um, and if you get four guys, each one's carrying 100, problem, 100 pounds, that's not a huge issue. Especially if you get the, the appliance straps that can go underneath it. So the two guys on either end with an appliance strap running around it, it, uh, it'll carry up very, very easily. Um, so that is not, not the problem. And the other question I, I'm getting a lot is, oh, are you going to need to reinforce your floors? Because um, it's, it's literally going to go straight upstairs from where it is right now. And the table is about 600 pounds, which sounds incredibly heavy. But when you calculate in the weight of all the chairs and all the people and all the food on the table, the table is only 10% of the weight. Um, and so the floor is, is rated for far, far more than that we'll put onto it. Plus, it is um, 11 feet long, so it spans over um, a pile of different joists. So it's, yeah, the floor will hold it perfectly fine. <laughs> what all else right. we got? Let's see. Raven's Path said, any suggestions on how to mark dark barn wood to cut dovetails. Score lines from the marking knife are really hard to see. Um, better eyesight. <laughs> no, uh, marking, knife, marking lines are difficult to see. Um, and usually the, the answer to that is get a fine pencil and then trace in your line after you've marked it with the knife. Uh, because the knife will score the fibers so that one side leaves and the other side stays. Uh, but then you can come in with a pencil and darken it up so you can see it a little bit. Uh, I have used uh, colored pencils in the past. So if you're working with a walnut and the, the black 
of a regular pencil doesn't show up, then you can use a, a light white pencil. You just have to sharpen the tip enough so you're not getting this big smeared line. Um, but usually I'm still going to use a marking knife and then I'll come back and, and clean it up. Um, the other thing is using an awl as opposed to using a marking knife. Uh, the awl leaves a little bit wider line, um, but the awl, the line that that leaves is a little easier to see than what you can get with a, with a sharp marking knife. So, yeah. Tyler Kimball asks, can you do a show and tell on your Miller's, Miller's Falls spoke shave? I'm looking for one, but no, don't know a lot about them and what to look for. I don't think I have a Miller's Falls spoke shave. Uh, no, the Stanley, the Stanley. Yeah, all mine are Stanley except for this one, which I don't know what, I don't know who makes it, and I'd love to find out. Um, I've only seen one other one. And it's my favorite, but I don't know who makes it. So, well, here, let me show you. Um, that's, a, that's actually a video I want to do here soon, is different types of spoke shaves, and actually show them off, because I've got, I don't have a huge collection, but I have, well, I've got, what, six here. Oh, that's the I've one Tyler them. says. What's that? The one you're showing is the one. That yeah, one? That one. Is it Miller's Falls? It'd be interesting to try. But this is, let me show you this a little closer. Um... Get that cable out of the way. Zoom in. Oh, gotta flip it back. Sorry, wrong camera. Two. There we go. Oh, you're fuzzy. Sorry, I'll get a little better here. There we go. Uh, so this, this is my favorite because well, it has a it has a round bottom here, but I can easily open it up, take the front mouth off, flip it around, and it's got a flat side on here. So the round bottom then turns into a flat bottom. And so I can, oops, wrong way, that way. So I can use it as a flat bottom or a round bottom spoke shave. And uh, it's just kind of a, a neat little design. I don't use the flat bottom very often because once you get fairly, once you get fairly decent at um, controlling the round bottom, you know, a round bottom will do anything a flat bottom will as long as you can control its angle. And with a round bottom, you can actually change the pitch and if you're cutting shallow here and you can roll it a little bit more into the cut and get a deeper cut and so you just change that pitch a little bit to get a deeper cut or a lighter cut just depending upon how you control it and it's a nice nice little spoke shave but they come in all shapes and sizes and types and histories um, but you can never have enough spoke shaves they're they're a fun fun tool I should do a video on that. Maybe I'll do it for Thursday because I haven't decided on what I should do video on Thursday. Yeah, if any of you have any idea of what video I should do for Thursday, let me know. But a spoke shave might be a fun one. Let's think about that. See how I can work that into a video. All right, let's see. Robert Tholen or Tholen, I don't know. Um, why haven't you used the wooden plane you made as a collaboration with Rex Kruger or Krieger? Oh, yeah, the little, the little <laughs> I love that um, this is a very specific use plane um, it is a low angle plane and it is it's basically anytime I need to joint end grain um, that's what this was made for and that's a very rare thing that I use for jointing end grain um, and I just haven't had much use for it uh, <laughs> it's it's a nice plane for that and I, I, I could use it for regular standard use i just haven't uh, haven't done so uh, i think most of the time like if i'm doing the edge of the table here i grab my low angle jack just because it has more mass it's easier to hold up the table and slide along it if i was doing uh, like i had a bunch of put that back in uh, i had a bunch of plaques that i made a while ago that were 30 inches wide and so I would set, set those in there and I'd have all the ingrain standing up. This was perfect because I could be on top of it and slide across and clean those out. But uh, that's not a task I do that often, and so that's why I don't use this plane that much. Um, yeah, so I just haven't had much use for it. I mean, it's a nice plane. works really well. But <laughs> There are a lot of planes that, um, sp uh, sp for specific tasks, like compass planes, um, and dado planes and things like that that you just don't use that often because you need to have that particular task to use it. And that's this one is not a, a standard jack plane or something you use all the time. It is more or less for a specific task. 
Um, now I should probably sometime in the future make a bunch of regular wooden planes or even restore some of the, the old four planes that I have. Um, that'd be kind of fun to do. But uh, I've got a lot of other tasks I need to do first. <laughs> like the Honey, do this. We gotta get the table done. Bigger. All right, let's see. Um, Luis Perea. Uh, I'm probably butchering that. What happened to your lathe? Um, it's over there in the corner. Um, here, let me show you. It's uh, this pile of lumber right uh, right over here. That pile of lumber is the lathe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't have any space to have it built in the shop, and the nice thing about that that lathe is that it's locked down, so I can I can tear it apart and put it out of the way. And because the table is in the shop, um, there is no place for the lathe to be in the shop. The table is taking up all the space in here. So once I get that out of here, I have a couple projects I would like to do on the lathe. Um, I just haven't had much chance. And then sometime in the future, I do want to build a, a flywheel lathe. Uh, but that is something that is not tear down, so that, that takes up, that I have to dedicate a section of the shop to that. So I haven't quite decided if I want to do that or not. But yeah, um, sometime I would like to. But yeah, that, that's one of the big reasons why I made that spring pole lathe, is I can tear it apart, put it in the corner, and it doesn't take up much space. So yeah. All right, Cody Bryan asks, what is your absolute favorite plane above any other? Oh. Um. I think it'd be easier to answer which child do I like the most. Depends um, on the day. <laughs> I have to say that the Veritas custom plane. Um, this is when Veritas made a plane, when they made this plane, they basically took the entire history of planes and they threw it out the window and they said, we're going to make something that is very different and far more functional. And this is just the most amazing plane I've ever used. Um, this is, I, I would use this over any infill plane I've ever used. Uh, it's, it's a great, great plane. Uh, let, me, let me show you a little bit better. Uh, zoom in here a little bit. This is a Veritas custom plane, and they come in a bunch of different styles. They're, they are very expensive, um, and so that's why I only have the one. I'd like to have a full set someday, but I don't. Um, but you can actually adjust it. You can you can specify which tote you want. You can specify which knob you want. You can specify the type of steel. You can specify the bed angle. You can get it all the way down to, I think, 30 degrees and then all the way up to, well, you can special order any height you want. Um, it also has a mouth that opens and closes like you normally see on the low angle planes. And so you can normally adjust this, slide the mouth open so you can get your big heavy cuts and then remove it to a light cut. And then it also has this knob stop here, so I can I can roll it forward and set a stop. So when I slide the mouth closed, I don't hit the iron; I hit this stop instead. And so that is just one way of protecting the uh, the iron from running into that. Uh, then it also has these set screws on the side that hold the steel in place so it doesn't shift side to side. So when you put it back in, it goes back in the exact same place. It has the best Norris adjuster I ever had. There is no slop in this at all. It is just a really tight, nice feeling. Uh, it's got this incredibly thick sole here that tapers out. It is just, it's a fantastic, fantastic plane, and I, I absolutely love it. If I ever get the chance to have an entire set, um, I will. So I, I think that this is, is my favorite plane, which is kind of odd that it's not a historical plane. It's not a, uh, um, it's not a traditional plane at all, and my favorite plane is my newest, happiest plane. You're not traditional anyway. So. No, I, and, and a lot of people think that I am traditional. I'm not. I'm, I'm hand tool. Um, and I do things, I don't do things in a traditional manner. I do them in a way that I find them to be the most fun. It's just uh, the way I do things. Which is usually banging my head against a wall. Yes. But I find that to be very enjoyable. Yuppers. All right, let's see. Um, Robert Smith asks tips on getting a kid into woodworking. Don't want to overwhelm or complicate or overcomplicate in the beginning. First of all, tell them they cannot come in the shop and then they want to go in the shop. And then you tell them again, no, you cannot come in the shop. And then they really want to get in the shop. And then finally one day, okay, okay I'll let you into the shop for a minute. And then you rush them out of the shop and then they're, they're hooked for life. They want to be in the shop. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, um, simple projects like a, a cutting board, like a birdhouse, like a bird feeder, 
Um, the little things like that that are, are basic joinery, um, like I like to use dowel joinery because it's a very simple thing that they can run a brace and bit and, and draw, drill out a hole and then they get to pound a peg into the hole. Uh, you don't have to worry as much about you know, bending over nails or screws. Um, it's a simple form of joinery, very strong, and the kids enjoy it. Um, but usually I, I, I let Melody come up with an idea and she comes up with a crazy off the wall idea and then I try and refine it down to something that we can do. <laughs> um, yeah, different kids, different things. Like my daughter, she loves being in the shop. Any chance I can get her, any chance I allow her to come down here and, and work with me, um, that's that's it. JJ, uh, if I get a good project that he's interested in, he'll he'll come down to the shop and work with me. Arthur uh, hasn't quite figured out what's going. He on He needs yet. to know the math to go with it. Yeah, yeah. I'll let him engineer it, and then then we'll build it for him. Um, so. Yeah, every kid's different. Some kids will want it, some kids won't, and uh, that's life. And if they don't know, if sometimes kids like to watch kids, so Melody mm -hmm. has her own channel too, mm -hmm. and so sometimes. Yeah, Melody's that's workbench. Um, and the other thing, I, I made a bench for them, which is covered in my. <laughs> I was right gonna now. say. Um, and so sometimes when I'm down here in the shop, they'll be on their their bench banging away on something, and I have a set of tools that they can, you know, a blunted chisel and things like that that they can. They can pound around and, and, and break things and let them go with the scrap pile of wood and they're they, they think it's the best thing in the world. Yeah. Pretty much. Okay, let's see. Perka Wendell. Oh, people keep commenting, it's going away. Hello, joining you from Sweden. Sweden. Um Love your oh it, people keep commenting and it went away. Love your work. Do you have any videos with three way joint, like three boards going in X, Y, and Z direction, if that makes sense? Um, yes and no. Uh, the Japanese liked doing that, but anytime where you have three boards directly intersect, you create a weaker joint. The more boards that come into the same point, the weaker the joint is. Um, and it can be done right, but you're going to get a weaker joint there. Um, in the Western style, usually what you have is you have two boards that come together, and then those two boards then will connect into a third board. Um, like on a, a shelf, you have a uh, you have the corner of two boards that come together, not, not a shelf. Like I'm thinking of a dresser shelf. Um, so you have the, the the front and side rails come together, and then those will then go into the dado slot in the leg. And so you you connect two pieces together and then connect them into a third. Um, anytime you're trying to connect a third piece, it gets weaker, and so I, I don't do that as much. Actually, I don't think I've ever done that with hand tools. Um, I don't see much of a need to it. Whereas in the Japanese tradition, um, it's all about hiding the joinery. And, well, it's not all about hiding the joinery, but there's, there's a lot of focus on making the joinery disappear and making the boards meld together. And uh, because of that, having three or four boards come together at a, at a given point makes it so you can, you can hide the joinery. But then all of the pieces that then have to go together to lock all become smaller and smaller. And the smaller those pieces are, the weaker the individuals are, the better chance that something is going to break. So that's probably why I don't do it much. Um, but who knows, maybe I should um, play around with it and do a video. <laughs> uh, I just don't have much of any direct use for it. So that's that. All right, let's see. 1975 Bright asks James what are your thoughts on the compass plane I think it's a rather round and fun plane <laughs> um, the compass plane is a cool plane to have on your shelf looks good sitting up there um, but it's a really really rare thing that that it's very useful uh, because a compass plane doesn't create the entire arch. You create the arch, and then this will come through and refine it and clean it up. And this will give you that, that finished shape that you're looking for. And the compass plane will guarantee the, um, the uniformity of the curve. And so because of that, it's, there aren't a lot of applications for it. So if you're, if you're looking for a useful tool, don't, don't get a compass plane. Um, you can make curves perfectly fine without a compass plane. This just makes it a little bit easier to refine that and get that really nice curve. Um, if you're doing things 
um, like the bottom stretchers on furniture and you want that nice long curve on there, then this, this becomes a very useful tool. Um, and that's probably the only place I've ever used it for. I, I've seen a few other times where um, things just have a natural curve in the wood. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of uh, a while ago, like two or three years ago, uh, Woodworkers Fighting Cancer did a, uh, um, a, a, a table and chairs set for kids and it had a whole bunch of, of curves in the plywood. And so Shan Rogers was using a compass plane to create those curves or to refine those curves. And for that it works well, but it's just not a, it's not a useful plane, but it's a really fun plane. So if you have the money for one, great. They're a lot of fun, they look good on the wall, but uh, I think I would use them about once every three to four years, if that, so. You might have a friend who has one. <laughs> All right, and then Louise asks, who's taking care of the kids right now? YouTube kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, we, we put them in bed and we let them watch their, their, uh, their phones for half an hour to an hour. And then we'll be done with this and we'll go upstairs and they're probably still watching their phones. Although Arthur was working on a math multiplication Arthur's always working on something. Yeah. Mm. He likes it. Okay, let's see. Bathrobe Carpenter asks, so when are you going to make a Cooper's plane? Um, which one? There's a bunch of different planes that are specific to Cooper's. Unless you're talking about like a, uh, the, the large Cooper's plane, which is... Um, so you imagine I joined her, but it's like four to five foot long. And then you take it, you make it a very wide mouth, you flip it upside down and you mount it to a bench and then you run your staves over that. So the plane stays in, in place but the wood moves over the, the plane. Um, really fun tool and I just have no use for one. <laughs> uh, it's a very specific tool to a very specific style of woodworking. And one of these days I would like to actually get into doing some Cooper's work and, and making a barrel or a bucket or a mug or something of that nature. Um, but I'm probably going to have to work with some other channel to make uh, the steel rings unless I want to do um, woven um, basket rings. But it's a, it's a, fun, a fun task. I've done uh, a few small things similar to that, but I've never actually done a full barrel or a, you know, a full bucket. That would be, be a good time. But no, I don't have a Cooper's plane. That would be a, a fun one to have. If that was the plane you were talking about, let me know. Because there's also a plane for running around the top of the barrel. There's the plane for cutting in the groove inside of the barrel. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of other planes that are specifically designed for working with, with Cooper's work. Sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Colin McLaughlin asks, Hi, do you send out woodworking stickers? If so, I would love to send mine to you. Um, yeah, um, you can send me a... Uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Send me an email. Um, go on my website, woodbyright.com, and there's a contact form on there where you could set up. Um, if you want to trade one, great, I'll trade with you. Um, otherwise, if you just want one straight up, then you can um, order one on my website. So there you go. You can ship them out that way. Let's see. So, what are the pl pluses of infill planes? Um, From Tyler? The, yeah, uh, infill plane. Let me grab this one. I only have two, and I, I, this well, this particular one is a is a poor re representation. It's a it's, it's a bad plane. Someone put it together did it poorly, um, but it's a good way to show. I got a good deal on it, so that's why I have it. <laughs> um, it's a good way to show what an infill plane is. An infill plane has metal on the sides, metal on the bottom, and then a wood infill, and. The nice thing about this is it makes it a much more solid plane. It makes it easier to, to work with and the vibrations are almost non-existent because it's a solid surface underneath here for the entire bed, it's a solid surface on top. So that there's nothing in this that flexes, there's nothing in this that bends, it is a very solid block. And so if you ever have any chatter where the blade is cutting through the wood, infill planes don't have that. They're really nice smooth feel and they, they feel phenomenal. Um, so that's where they're, they're just a really nice tool. And I, I'm hoping to do a collaboration here soon actually making an infill smoother. Um, but I haven't set that up yet. Now this one I bought 
because I wanted to redo it. It's got a bunch of odd problems that could be fixed if uh, someone took the time to do them right, <laughs> but um, just haven't gotten around to that. So yeah, an infill is just a, it's a very comfortable, feels good. It's the type of thing that, that feels right in your hand. Um, and most of the time when someone's gonna be buying an infill, if you're buying a new one, they're, you know, thousand or more dollars, um, or yeah, more than that. Uh, they get very, very, very expensive very quickly. But if you've got the money to spend on that, you're buying a tool that is precision made and exactly what you want and feels good. It's conformed to who you are and how you work and they, they feel phenomenal. That's, that's the big difference between, you know, an infill plane and a really good plane is that an infill plane feels like silk. It feels phenomenal. Um, does it work any better? Eh, depends on who you ask, um, but it feels good. So that's where infills really come in. All right. Um, so I had to chuckle because Jim Williams said that explains the flattening of your head when you were talking about hitting your head against the wall and enjoying <laughs> it. Um, Nicole Warren asks, is this your full-time job? Uh, my full-time job is a stay-at-home dad. Um, so my, my wife makes more money than I could dream about making. <laughs> and so I became a stay-at-home dad. This was my hobby to have something to keep my brain sane when being around the kids. And it has turned into more of that. Um, so it has been a business in the past and now it is it's becoming more and more of a of a business and a large point a part of the family income um, that being said I, I i try and keep it fun i try and keep it um not as much business oriented and that's one of the reasons why i don't have any sponsors i want this to be more just having fun in the shop i want it to be far more flexible than what it would be if it were a full-time business of, of creating content so yeah that's where i'm at but my when people ask me, generally I'm going to say, I, I am a full-time stay-at-home dad. So I, I take care of the kids. <laughs> Although they're all in school now. Yeah, so. they're in school. So I actually have a lot of time in the shop, which is kind of yeah. nice. Well, I try to have time in the shop. Occasionally we go on dates because they're all in school when I'm off. Yeah. Yay. All right. 1975 Bright says, I wonder if we're going to see James do burpees today. Super chat. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Super chat. Uh, <laughs> worked last time. Uh, Cody Bryant. James, I want to get into carving. What size and maker V gouge would you recommend? Um, the, I would love to give you a specific number, um, but I can't remember what is off the top of my head. Uh, if, you, if you go to my website, um, woodbywright.com backslash tools, uh, there's a whole listing of all the tools that I recommend, suggest, or tools that I use. And in the chisel section, I go, actually go through and show the V tool I have, the set of uh, uh, two cherry chisels that I normally use. Um, so if you want to see the specific ones I have, you can you can go there and, and find all, all that information. Um, I want to I'm trying to remember because it's the the Pfeffel, um, Pe Pe how do you want to pronounce it? Um, can't remember the numbers on the top of my head. So yeah, go there and you'll you'll see the exact ones. Or if you're looking for any other particular tools, um, I need to go through there and revamp it. I haven't added a few things that I've gotten there recently, so we'll do that soon. All right, let's see. Um, Ed said I was wondering when building a live edge table, do you have to epoxy the wood slab? Uh, you don't have to. Um, in mine, I have a whole bunch of voids and bug holes, and um, I've got about three gallons worth of voids in this, and so that's why I'm filling it with epoxy. If you have a nice clean slab that doesn't have any holes or voids, um, or if you like the holes and voids in your tabletop, then no need to epoxy it. The, the finish that I'm going to be putting on the tabletop is not epoxy. I'm going to be using um, Rubio Monocoat, uh, so it's an oil-based um, finish. Uh, the only reason I have the epoxy on there right now is filling all the voids. So I'm actually going to be scraping off the excess epoxy and just getting down to bare wood and then putting the finish onto that. But uh, you can just see the epoxy now because of that last coat I put on there. 
Troy says, Mom, Sarah, and Melody video could be fun. <laughs> um, let's Put that in the carving contest. Or just Melody and I take over the shop and you do this. You know. That would be an interesting live. That would be entertaining. All right. Mariano Jimenez says, oh, Jimenez, what made you start with hand tools? Um, I had power tools before. I had a full power tool shop. And every time we moved, we sold off more and sold off more. And basically, in our last house, I had I sold all my tools. And I just assumed, well, I guess I'm not doing any woodwork anymore. Um, but then we moved here, and there's a space in the basement that was 8 foot by 10 foot. And I saw a video of a guy making a grooving plane worth the effort on YouTube. He may actually be in the chat tonight. He I haven't seen him yet. But. Um, but he made a grooving plane, and it just kind of it was this aha moment of, wait a second, I, I could do that. And in the shop, because uh, I'm a stay-at-home dad, so I can have the kids in the shop. There's no dust. It's quiet. It's, it's safer. I don't have power tools to worry about the kids being around. Uh, it was just this perfect moment that I could do all of this in a little small eight foot by 10 foot space in the basement with kids. And that was the learning process of learning woodworking all over again. And a lot of fun. And if you want to actually go back and see it, my first video is, Hey, look, I just bought my first ever hand plane. And, um, uh, from then on. So <laughs> it's been a fun, ride, wild ride. All right. Let's see. Luis says, what kind of chairs are you going to make for the table? Have you designed it yet? We kind of talked about that earlier. But I don't know if that got caught off in the yeah, original part. Yeah, uh, haven't, I haven't designed the chairs that I want for it yet. I'm going to build a bench for one side of the table uh, for three kids. So a, a long bench that uh, three adults could sit very comfortably. And uh, have that. I want to have a very similar base construction to the, 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 the bench and, and do a, a combination of that. Um, but then for the chairs, because I do want to make a whole set of chairs, I'm thinking 12 chairs that I want to make. And I haven't actually found what I want yet. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time looking at that because making chairs is a very repetitive thing. It would not be very good for videos. I could make one chair and make several good videos on that, but making 12 chairs would be a lot of time where I'm not shooting any footage. Um, so I may end up actually making one with hand tools and then making the other 12 with power tools uh, and doing a, a comparative video and showing the, the differences between you know, doing a hand tool and doing power tool. And then at the end, having them all set out and, and having you know, people when they come over, they can say, well, which one of these 12 was made with a hand tool? Um, I thought that would be kind of a, a fun one to do. But <laughs> yeah, we haven't decided yet. We'll see. All right, let's see. Raven's Path says, any suggestions on the arc to turn a modern Stanley number no. 4 into a scrub plane? I actually have an entire video on that. If you type in woodbywright.com, uh, if you type in woodbywright uh, scrub plane, it will probably be the first video to pop up. And everyone's going to give you a different number. For a number 4, I'm probably going to say an 8-inch radius is about right. Um, maybe a 7-inch. Anything bigger than that, you're going to have a, a it's going to be sticking out of the mouth in good ways. Um, if it's in an actual scrub plane, I, it's about a six inch radius um, because the mouth is, is thinner, so the, the radius needs to be um, smaller to make it stick out of the mouth farther. Um, but most of the time, I'm going to do about an eight inch radius, but nothing picky. I, I, I have to prerequisite whenever I make one, I don't actually measure out the radius, I just go. Mm, that looks about right, and then grind it down to that. That's that's all I do. All right. Raven's Path said, Steel Barrel Rings collab with Alex Steele. That would be fun, especially since he's coming to Montana. That would be a, a very Montana. good time. Montana. When, when, when? Yeah, he's moving to Montana. When are you going to Montana? I don't know. Oh, well, I. you made it like... No, um, he's moving to Montana. Well, where is he now? UK. Ah! There's the important link I did not know. <laughs> now, I would like to do a collab with him sometime, but, uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. BK Mevos has been watching for a bit. Lots of good information. Reminds me of Norm Abrams or the Woodwright Shop. Thanks for the video. 
thought that was funny. Um, let's Gotta love see. the good old Roy Underhill shows. Um, Cody Bryant says, any plans on making and selling tools? No, um, I don't like selling the things I make because then my time is spent making the things to, to get to other people. And I'd rather my time spent creating content for other people to see as opposed to creating tools to sell. Um, so I, I don't have much intention of that. Every now and then I'll make something that I will then, um, most of the time I end up giving it away. I don't like selling things as much. Um, so I, I, don't, I, I don't generally sell what I make anymore. So, yeah. Let's see. G Gar Carbonite Gamorian says, did you have to do anything to your SW number 62? Um, my low angle jack, the new Stanley version? Um, no. Actually, comes out pretty well. Some people are going to get really picky. And, and then I also have to say that their, their quality control isn't as amazing as old Stanley was. Um, and so sometimes there'll be slight issues one way or the other. Um, but most of the time, the problem that people complain about is the bottom not being flat. And most of the time, the reason that they're complaining about the bottom not being flat is that they're using a micron meter and they're measuring this to the finest of intensities. Um, and there's no reason to do that. There's no reason for this sole to be dead perfectly true within a ten thousandth from end to end. Um, if this is within two thousandths from here to here, that's perfectly fine. Um, really, that it's not an issue. As long as it's flat at the mouth, the toe, and the heel, you're, you're good. Um, other than that, the only thing I'm a little picky on this is the aluminum cap, but honestly, I haven't had any issue with it. It works pretty well. It's just, it feels cheaper, but functionally, it is great. And for the price, you really can't, you really can't beat that. So um, for the price, this is usually what I'm gonna be suggesting. Is it the best in the market? No, uh, but for quality wise, it's phenomenal. And you can't even get the antique ones anywhere near this price. Now they have gone through the roof and it's not uncommon to find an antique low angle plane for like 250 or more. So yeah, no, I really like it. All right, Stamp let's... of approval. Where'd you bring out your Sean Connery all of a sudden? Many things you can't go wreck with the bullets. <laughs> Anyways, Russ Staples says, James, are you, ever are you ever going to get some really good bench chisels? You have decent carving chisels. I have really good bench chisels. We have ones from Aldi. They're really good. I like them. Um, I, I may in the future, I, I have several Narex chisels. I mean, like I have you know, this one here. I haven't found a high-end chisel that I like. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, the steel on them are all fanta fantastic. The Lee Nielsen, really nice. I, I can't stand the handles on the Lee Nielsen. They're just not comfortable to me. Um, I, I haven't found one that I, that I really like. What I'm probably gonna do sometime in the future is take these Aldi chisels and remove the handle and make my own handle that's exactly what I want and from that point on, I have no need for any other chisel in the rest of my life as long as I don't, you know, break one of these. Um, is the steel on those the best? No, but it's really close. <laughs> so, no, I have, I have no need to go get a high-end chisel and spend money on those. And, and part of me really likes using these dirt cheap chisels. I mean, because the two sets I have here, the one's from Aldi and the other ones are from Harbor Freight. Um, and I like using these because it, it shows people you don't need to spend the money. You can go out and buy a $7 set of chisels and do woodworking. Is the steel, is the edge going to last as long? No, it's probably going to dull a little quicker and you have to sharpen a little more often. But oh well, then you learn how to sharpen. And there is no reason to spend crazy amounts of money up front. Now, if you want to spend a lot of money on a really good high-end set of chisels, phenomenal. Go and do it. Um, but not everyone has that option. And so I'd like to show people... You don't need to do that. And so that's why a lot of my tools, I mean, I do have some tools that are really expensive and I have other tools that aren't. Um, and I like to show that, that back and forth. You don't need the high-end stuff to do that. So, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of rabbit trail there. Russ Staples asks, what do you do for work, Sarah? I get a question. <laughs> I am a registered nurse at a hospital. 
near where we live, obviously. But. So if you're ever sick in this area, you know you're in good hands. Because I live with someone who won't take any of my advice anyway. <laughs> it's a good thing I didn't see that lifting video until afterwards. Yes, I did it while she was away. Anyways, let's see. Gazak says, I'm glad you don't wear the ugliest Packers jersey anymore in your videos. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to get a new one out. No. <laughs> Let's see. Scott Caro asks, how is the spring pole lathe going? It's done. And I've done quite a few projects on it. Did some bowls and handles and pins and things of that nature. And it's all sitting over the corner. We it's just actually talked about it a little while ago. Packed away for a little bit. I'll probably be pulling it out again here soon when the table's out. It is a very fun toy to play with. So we've had a couple people give ideas about the chairs. <laughs> and one is um, B52 Pickup says, just hold a chair making class for 11 people. <laughs> yes. Or it says, have a contest where we all make chairs and send them to you and you accidentally keep them. Now I've got... Uh... A dozen or so different designs rolling around in the back of my head. And usually the way my design my design works is I have all of these thoughts where I'm walking through some place and I see something, I'm like, ooh, I like that aspect of it. And I keep that in the back of my brain. And that gets morphed into the other thing. And that's, that's how this, the table came to be, is that base was probably three or four dozen tables that I've seen in the past with different trestle bases and different constructions. And they all kind of came together for a little bit here and a little bit there to show what I what I want. And so I'll end up doing the same thing with the chairs, but it'll probably be mm -hmm. another year or two until um, chairs are made. So we'll see. All right, I'm trying to stay awake. I don't know why I'm so tired tonight. <laughs> um, and I'm trying not to yawn, and I'm doing a closed mouth yawn. I don't think it's <laughs> working. Um, let's see, Cody Bryant, what is your view on the number six plane? Is it, use, is it a useful bench plane, or should it be passed up for a number seven or eight? Number six. Um, that is a very personal question because the number six isn't quite a jack plane. It, it's not the plane I would use for smoothing. And so because of that, if you're going to get a number six, you probably need a number four somewhere in your shop as well. Whereas with a number five, you can smooth with it. You can joint with it. It's not really good at either one, but you can do both. With a number six, you can joint with it. Um, but sixes are often the same price as a seven or an eight. And so if you already have to have other planes, if you already have to have a number four, I usually tell people try and get a seven or an eight rather than a six. It is very rare that I grab for my six. Um, it's just not a plane that I use that often. Uh, it, it's, it's that in-between stage where if I'm going to be jointing something, I'm going to grab a longer plane even if I don't need it. It's just it's a longer plane. It's going to make things flatter, easier. And if I'm going to be smoothing, I'm going to be grabbing a smaller plane. Um, so this is kind of that in-between where it doesn't fit that much one way or the other. Now, that being said, a lot of people really, really love the 6 because it gives that, it, it's a very heavy plane, and that, that size it feels good. When it runs down the board, it feels like a jointer plane. And so in your hand, it's a nice plane to have. Um, so a lot of people really like that. But usefulness... You ask different people, you're going to get different answers. But for me, uh, only buy a number six if you really want the full set. <laughs> but it's just my personal opinion. Some people are going to want something different. All right, let's see. BK Mevo says, just start out with using a hand plane, trial and error, mostly error. Any quick tips for beginners? Um, the most important thing when you're working with a plane for the first time is your foot stance. Um, having a nice wide stance, move your feet farther apart. You usually want one foot 90 degrees to the other and be able to work and relax a little bit. Don't try and put all the force down into it. So a lot of people are trying to put a lot of weight down on the plane, pushing it into the work. If your plane is sharp and ready for use, you don't need to be putting a lot of weight in it. You should be putting all your weight down on your feet and moving the plane with just your upper body strength and not putting your weight on top of it. Uh, but for most people, the biggest problem is their is their their foot stance, and that's one of the reasons that Sarah was having a lot. I was of gonna issues say, or is, the proper size bench. Yeah, you know, <laughs> this is my, my wife when she was playing. <laughs> she was on a stool that's you know only you know a foot by eight inches, 
and so she can't have a good stance. She's with her feet close together, and you can't get your weight behind it. <laughs> I'm sorry, your dance move right now is very entertaining. No, yeah. with the. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's probably the the biggest problem that most people have is their their stance, and everyone's gonna have slightly different issues. And if I watch you, then I can tell you, hey, do this or do that. Um, but everyone's gonna have a slightly different problem and so I can't say you know this is your issue this is how you fix it uh, so it's one of the reasons why I don't have a video on it because it's not I, I guess I could do it with like the top 10 problems but there's 300 problems that someone else is gonna have so yeah <laughs> all right let's see I'll do that. Colin McLaughlin asks, hi, what is the drying timeline for different woods? Does it go by the thickness? Um, the rule of thumb is one inch per year. One inch of thickness per year. So if it's two inches thick, it's going to take two years to dry. That rule of thumb is really wide because different types of wood will dry at different rates. Um, where it's being dried, how dry the air is. Uh, what the temperature of the air is are going to wildly change what it will be. Um, if I bring a slab down to my shop that's two inches thick, it will be dry in around a year. It's just because the, 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 the air down here is 70 degrees, it's really nice and dry, and it sucks the wood, it sucks the, the moisture out of the wood pretty quickly. Um, so you're going to have different different things for it. But as to different types of wood, usually the harder the wood, the slower it is to dry because there's more material for the water to work through to get out, uh, whereas softer woods will dry a little faster. Uh, that being said, there isn't a huge variance in that as it is with uh, the temperature and moisture of the, the room it is held in. That is the, the bigger change in it. Variable, there's the word I'm looking for. What's next? Let's see. Mike Gordo. Are you familiar with PAX panel saws? Finding a good distance in my area is difficult, whereas the Lee Valley nearby carries a few PAX rip and cross cut saws. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, they are they're decent. Uh, I've only gotten a chance to use them a couple times and uh, everything I've tried is, is good. Uh, I, I find them to feel very cheap in the hand. I, I, they're, they're, they're very obvious that they're machine made and I'm very picky about the, the handle on a saw. Um, but that being said, they're, they're a good working saw. Uh, I'd be interested to find out why you're having a hard time finding saws because no matter where I go in the United States, I find um, dozens of saws in most every antique shop I go to. Um, and you don't have to get a distant. They can be just about any um, old company. I actually have a video on how to choose an old, uh, how to um, choose a handsaw. Um, so if you want to see that, I go through what I look for in a saw. And of the saws, I get probably only like 20% are distants because there were a lot of saw companies out there at the time that uh, made really good stuff that's still around. But when, when picking out a saw, look at the handle, don't look at the plate. The handle will tell you far more about the saw. Is it, is it something that was handmade? Is it something that was a lot of detail put into it? Or did a router run around it and create the handle? Uh, that will tell you far more about the saw than anything else. Everyone keeps saying the other tip you should give to a beginner with hand planes is wax the sole. <laughs> yes. Uh, no. Don't wax the sole until you've used it for an hour or two and then put wax on it and suddenly you're like, whoa, it's this whole new thing. <laughs> yeah. You notice he didn't tell that to me? Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. waxed the sole after you did it for a little while. You didn't do it live. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Mm, Go back and watch it. All right. Let's see. Um, I love this tool rack. Jim Williams says, have you, no, I take that back. Going back to Ed Radcliffe. Have you ever considered doing a Viking chest from the tree to the, the finished project? Yes. Yes, I want to. Um, and I want to do it with the Viking tools, which was an axe. Um, a Viking would make um, 
all their woodworking and their joinery with an axe. Uh, it was a very versatile tool. You can plane with it, you can chop with it, you can do mortises, you can do tenons, um, and uh, it's, it's a fun one. But yes, I would like to do that someday, but uh, have not. That would be a, a fun project. I'd like to do a few projects soon, uh, tree to finish product. And that's one of the things I'm going to be showing when I do the table because the, the base from it was on a base that a friend and I cut down. We chopped down a tree in his front yard and uh, slabbed it up and dried it. And so that has been through the entire process, tree into table. And the top is from Matt Carmona. So he was the one who chopped it down, slabbed it, and dried it in his backyard. So it's kind of fun to have the whole history of the, the lumber in the table. Jim Williams. Now, his question is this, have you seen the Paul Sellers video where he planes without using downforce? Yes, we pull out of the string. It's a good, uh, a good example. If, you're, if your plane is set up right, um, on most woods, if the grain is good and the wood is not too hard, uh, you can actually pull a plane forward without any downforce at all, and the blade is enough to actually hold the plane in place and, and pull a shaving. But if you're doing that in harder things like maple, then it causes slight issues. And you have to have a little bit of downforce, but really only like a pound, if that. All right. Cody Bryant says, any plans to teach any classes in Georgia? Um, no. Uh, I don't get many. Uh, I've only taught three or four classes. Um, and usually it's someone who contacts me and says, hey, I've got a space. You want to come teach a class? And most of the time I tell people, you know, as long as my expenses are covered, great, I'll come teach a class. It'd be a, a fun time. So, yeah, if you've got a place you want me to teach, then set it up. Maybe we can make it happen. Let's see. <clears throat> Carbonite Gamorian says, how flat should a block plane be? <laughs> a block plane? Um, not much at all. <laughs> uh, if, if you can hold up a block plane to a square... And this is how I check if a block plane's flat. Yep, looks good. Um, <laughs> um, if, if you can set it on a table and if it rocks, uh, you have to you know back the iron out because the iron sticking out way too far on this one. Um, but if you set it on a table and it rocks back and forth, then it's not flat. If you set it on a table and it's not rocking, then it's it's plenty flat. Um, block planes do not need. Um, detail flatness. The only time you really need a detail flatness is on your big jointer because that is telling you that the board is flat or on your smoothing plane when you're doing that last final shaving and you're doing like half a thousandth coming off the wood um, then having a really flat clean sole is, is important but that's about it. Let's see Mark Baldwin says what do you think of hawk blades slash irons? Worth the money? Um if all of my planes, with the exception of the one I made, have the original iron in them, or an original iron in them, uh, they work perfectly fine. And until you've been using them for a year or more or even longer, you're not going to notice the difference between a really high quality, thicker um, plane you get from like Hawk or Lee Valley. Uh, they're... The original blades work perfectly fine. So no, I, I have no reason to replace them. If I have a plane where the iron is bad and I can't work with it and I don't have another one on hand, then I'm usually going to go to Hawk or Lee Valley and pick up one of those. Um, it is a great replacement blade and I'm, I'm going to buy one of those before I go and buy an antique one from somewhere. Um, they are a better blade than the original one, but the amount better is, is so small that it becomes that, that perfectionist is looking for it. And not the the average person wouldn't notice or feel the difference. All right. So let me just say, Troy Jacobson and you think the same. As he goes, how about a plane powered by a model rocket motor? Because <laughs> you need ideas like that. Yeah, if anyone hasn't seen that video, uh, I have a video on planing wood with uh, rockets. So I strap rockets. That's why my... My Stanley Sweetheart actually has these burn marks in here uh, where the, the parachute ejection fired forward. And I forgot about that. Oops. Um, yeah, it was kind of fun. It was, it was an experiment playing with it. All the things have to be set up.
to have the rocket aiming just right to actually fire down the, the ramp and to take a shaving. It's a good video. Yeah. It's like a year and a half ago. Maybe I should redo that one. Let's finish the tape. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Bill Tiffin says, I'd like to see a video that shows your top 10 beginner planning errors. So. <laughs> Maybe yeah. I'll have to add that one to the list. All right. Let's see. Jay Holworth, 1974, says, Hey, James, what do you know about Canada tool shows or swaps? Um, there are a few. Uh, there aren't a lot in Canada. Uh, there's, there's a couple in Toronto. Um, I'm trying to see what, if you want to see, I have an entire web page devoted to where to find hand tools. And I have a listing of online sites where you can buy antique hand tools. I have a listing of all of the hand tool uh, collectors organizations. So groups that regularly put together the tool meets. Um, so you can see if any of those are around you. And then I have a, a map that is every <laughs> location I know of in the world where you can find hand tools. So there's antique stores that sell hand tools. There are hand tool specific stores, there are tool meets, um, there are other organization groups that then will have hand tools for sale. And so you can look at the map and see all of them on there. If you go to woodbyright.com backslash tools, um, down at the bottom it has a section for antique tools and that takes you to that page. So yes, um, you can also go to woodbyright.com backslash antique underscore tools, but it's just easier to go to woodbyright.com tools. And you can find all that information and see the map and find where are there things around you. But yes, there are a few in, in Canada. There aren't very many. Um, and we'd like to change that and actually get a few more up there. So we'll see. And if you find any, let us know. Yes. Yeah. If anyone has a location that isn't on the map, that is a good place to buy tools, please let me know. I want to add it and uh, make that map even better. Let's see. Clicking again. It was oh 1975 bright says has anyone heard of acacia trees is the wood any good or is it just junk yeah um sneeze <laughs> that's what it is Woo -ha! No, that was a good one um <laughs> i have never worked with acacia um, but there are many things you can make out of acacia it's wood all wood is a functional, useful wood. Um, and a lot of people will tell you is that, no, you can't use that wood for making this. Yes, you can. You can make it out of anything you want. Um, some things will end up being a little better than others, but wood is a functional, useful wood. Um, and acacia is a wood that I've seen many people make different things out of. I've never actually gotten a chance to play with it myself, and I would like to, but haven't yet. So, All right, we've got like try. five more questions since 8.09. Are we going to oh, cap my. it then? Wow. Yeah, let's just do a few more questions here, and we'll wrap it up. Okay, so if they're already up here, we'll get through them. Let's see. Um, Ross Hollinger says, I have a Yankee number 31 screwdriver, and I can't get the handle off. There's no end cap screw, so I'm stumped. Do you have any suggestions? Um, do I have mine up here? No, I don't have mine up here. I've never actually taken one of those apart, so no, I would not know. I would have to fiddle with it and figure it out myself. Um, most of the time, there is a pin that goes through the shaft into the wood and you have to drive out that pin. Uh, but I don't remember particularly on that screwdriver. So, sorry. If you go to the uh, Unplugged Woodworkers page on YouTube, uh, on uh, Facebook, um, post a couple pictures on there and you'll have like four or five people who will tell you exactly what you need. A lot of good historians on there. All right, let's see. Jay Hatcher says, I have a bunch of plywood and not much money. Any advice on how to use it in a workbench top? Um, yes. Actually, uh, if you get like an inch and a half worth of plywood, lay down two sheets of three-quarter inch, that can be a decent top, actually. Uh, you're going to have to do more support underneath it because uh, it, it's, it's a little bit more flexible. But yes, you can make a, a temporary workbench out of that. Uh, one of the things that I've seen um, several people do is you actually take two sheets of plywood, or you take a full sheet of plywood, um, eight foot, and you slice it in half, and so it's two foot by eight foot. And you put those two together, you glue them, and you put in a few screws to clamp it all down together. You can take out the screws afterwards. And then you take that slab and you set it on top of sawhorses, 
and clamp it down to the sawhorses and you have a temporary workbench. Um, so yes, it can work very well. The, the only problem with plywood is you're always working in a cross grain situation, so you always have to be cutting the fibers or using a cross grain saw and uh, it kind of gets annoying after a while, but it works. All right, and I think this is going to be the last question of the night. Emily Watkins asks, I'm getting more into woodworking. I'm finding it hard to do so without a bench advice. Problem is, I live in a New York City apartment. Any ideas? Yes. Um, there are a lot of people in your situation. And uh, the, the most common ones are modifying the kitchen table or the, uh, the, the, the kitchen countertop. I've seen quite a few people actually make benches, small benches that are like two foot by two foot that can clamp onto a tabletop or clamp onto a countertop. And in that, mount a vise on it. Um, if you look up a, um, what's it called, vise on vise, or no, no, a bench on bench. Um, and so it's usually a small bench top, and I want to make one of these eventually. And it's usually like two foot by two foot, and it's intended to sit on the bench and be up a little bit higher. Uh, but if you put that on a table, it ends up being a really nice bench height. And you have a, a vise mounted to the front of that, so you actually make this small bench that can go on to different things. Um, another thing to look up is the planing beam. Um, uh, um, Shan Rogers at the Hand Tool School actually has a good video on the planing beam. And it's a it's basically a beam, so four inches by however long you want it, and you can work on top of that. You can do a lot of things on top of that with just a couple dogs and, and clamps. Um, Veritas also makes the, uh, what do they call it, the bench dog vise? It's, it's a dog that goes into a hole with, this, with a screw, so you can actually, you know, as long as you have a line of dog holes, you can put a dog in one end and then the vise screw in the other end and you can make a vise on any surface as long as you're drilling in three quarter inch holes. Um, so that's a, a good one. I don't remember what the name of that is. Someone put moxin vise. What's that? A moxin vise? Yes, a moxin vise. Uh, mine is somewhere. But a moxin vise is two parallel plates that clamp together and that's um, often used for joinery so you can clamp it to the top of the bench top. Uh, Mox and Vice is more specific to working on the end grain, so if you're doing joinery, uh, it's not as good for all the general planing, but uh, it is a, a good vice. But yeah, right. look up bench on bench, and you'll get a bunch of good ideas that work well in a in a uh, apartment. There are quite a few people who do apartment workshop, and usually in a kitchen or dining room. Uh, it's a lot of fun, but uh, <laughs> interesting uh, interesting place to be. Russ says a bench pup. Bench pup. There's the word. Thank you, Russ. Oh, uh, no. No. Well, mm. no, no, no. The bench pup. Well, here. Because you have a bench dog. Well, there's a bench. And then like someone this. wrote bench bowl. Maybe bench bowl. Is a bench dog is this, know. and the bench pup is the shorter one. Uh, but every company has a different name for things. So. I can't remember what they, they call it. But yeah, if you go to Veritas, uh, the. Uh, Lee Valley, you'll you'll come across it. All right, cool. That wraps it up. Well, I think that about does it. So, if anyone has any ideas for what you want us to do next week, which I haven't quite thought through what I want to do, um, we'll probably be doing some sort of weird celebration because hopefully next week for the live, the table will be upstairs. Maybe we'll do the live from the uh, the dining room. Mm. <laughs> we can invite everyone to supper. Yes, yes. <laughs> we'll see. So if you have any ideas of something you'd oh, like to see. Oh, they're shouting week. Wonder Dog at me. Wonder Dog. There's the term. Yes. At first, I thought it was a joke. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yes. Um, that's a, a Wonder Dog and a Bench Dog. You actually have your, your vice on that. Just get a big, beefy block of wood, drill three-quarter inch holes into it, and you can use that, clamp the wood to whatever surface you're working on, and you've got yourself a bench. So, booyah. Cool. I think you've... Uh, squandered enough time with us so thank you for coming and if you have any ideas let us know and we'll hopefully be back next week with the table upstairs Yay! I, think about it. I should Tell time them whether it's five minutes or not because they keep saying they don't believe you'll take five minutes <laughs> till next time see you later